Crocodile. Also known as Mr. Zero, was the first villain in the series who actually made me feel scared out of my pants for Luffy, being the first villain to push our rubber boy to his absolute limit. Crocodile is simply just one of the coolest characters ever created and one of my favorite villains in the series, arguably having the slickest design in all of One Piece. I have always enjoyed Crocodile's character from his mysterious intrigue to his ruthlessness as an arc's antagonist, as well as the absolute hype he exudes like being one of the standouts of the epic summit war filled with some legendary figures. And although Crocodile is generally associated with the past, an early series villain who is very reminiscent of the pre-time skip days, I actually think we have cause to believe that Crocodile will be returning to shock us with his appearance in the final saga. And in this video, I will explain why and how it will be Buggy who is the key to bringing Crocodile back into the story. Hello Manakamatachi, this is Joy Girl, and this is why and how Crocodile will be making his way back into the final saga of One Piece. And if this idea intrigues you and you'd like to hear more interesting One Piece discussions like this, then you know what to do with that subscribe button. Now with the amount of hype I just gave him, you may think I am just talking out my backside and this is just the crazy whims of a fangirl and maybe you're not entirely wrong. Crocodile is such an awesome character where you almost feel it's a shame he was introduced so early, thereby making him a victim to becoming an early series villain, being defeated by a still nascent, non-gear, non-haki Luffy, thereby making Crocodile's own strength and power somewhat questionable if we try to imagine how he would fare against all the crazy number of incredible powers we've seen in the series since. But at the end of the day, Crocodile is exactly what was needed to instill that great amount of fear and foreboding we needed, appropriate for the first time we had been built up over a series of arcs to face that one final boss. But I promised you this isn't just a video about how cool Crocodile is, because make no mistake, Crocodile's time is not yet over. And there are actually plenty of moments in the series that suggest that Crocodile is coming back and will most likely play a key role in the final saga. For one, Crocodile himself says that he will make it to the new world. Following the war at Marineford, he tells his former subordinate, Does Bones, that he intends on heading back to the new world, so the intent is there. And while this alone may not seem very significant, I mean, we've sure heard lines like that before. But this is different because although we haven't had confirmation on where exactly he is, it does certainly seem like Crocodile has successfully made it to the new world and has continued to survive. We see a glimpse of him in chapter 700 and then again as recent as chapter 903. And it's worth noting that both of these chapters contained characters reacting to newspaper updates of significant events. The former being Doflamingo's resignation from the Shichibukai and the second being Luffy's ascension to being at least dubbed the fifth emperor after his feats at Totoland. And while you could say that this makes it less meaningful that Crocodile was featured twice since the Marineford War, that it's just Oda choosing to show different familiar faces as Luffy progresses throughout the series. But I beg to differ. Because in these scenes, not only is Oda giving us an update about Luffy standing in the world and how he is affecting other plays and events, but through these cutaway reaction scenes, Oda is also giving giving us an update on these characters. Characters that will be impacted or inspired by Luffy's actions that will certainly breed progression on their part. And in Crocodile's case, we are getting two confirmations that he is still well and alive, presumably in the new world, most likely progressing with his plan. Crocodile's reaction would only be important to the extent it shows us his determination to keep going on with his journey as well, which causes me to think that Oda wants us to keep a close eye on Crocodile. He wants Crocodile's presence known and acknowledged, perhaps because Crocodile is still a relevant character. And he certainly wouldn't be the first villain introduced very early in the series who has continued to maintain a very relevant presence in the story. And yes, I am looking at you, Buggy. But also, in addition to this, Oda has built up Crocodile with enough intrigue and loose ends that still need to be answered. For example, I really need the 
answer to whether Mr. Zero was actually Mrs. Zero. I mean, what exactly did Ivankov mean about fixing Crocodile and keeping secret about whatever his so-called weakness is? This little mystery that Oda set up during the Impel Down arc, spawning the much-beloved fan theory of Crocomom, is honestly one of my favourite left-field tinfoil hat ideas. But also, on a more serious note, there really are plenty of current storylines where Crocodile would now seamlessly fit in. The first being Pluton. With more reveals about this ancient weapon being dropped very recently, this ancient battleship has found its way back to trending news. And we shouldn't forget that it was indeed Crocodile who first introduced us to the idea of reviving the ancient weapon. The ultimate goal behind his devious scheme of controlling the Alabaster Kingdom from the shadows was because he was after this weapon of mass destruction. Now you may remember that I recently made a video about the battle for Pluton and how different players could become embroiled in a scramble for this ancient weapon. And it's not crazy to think that Crocodile could still be on the hunt for it as well. Now obviously there is the fact he doesn't actually know that Pluton is located in Wano, but crazy events or circumstances could be made to lead him to finding out this information. I mean nothing would be as crazy as Buggy becoming one of the Yonko. Personally, I would love it if Crocodile does make his way back into this plotline because how awesome would it be to witness a reunion between Crocodile and the now reformed Robin, previously partnered with Mr. Zero as his Miss All Sunday, now being the trusty archaeologist of the Straw Hats, being captained by the very man who foiled Crocodile's plans. That's gotta sting for the former warlord. Seriously. Imagine this. Robin's safety is again threatened with others trying to acquire her knowledge of reading the Poneglyphs to revive Pluton, and in the middle of some battlefield as Robin is about to be taken, slashing sand comes out of nowhere and boom! Mr. Zero? Crocodile. Mr. Zero? Crocodile. Looking good, Miss O Sunday. But what happened to your tan? And another reunion that I'd really be looking forward to, and one that could actually work itself into the series very well, is if Crocodile is somehow involved in what happened to Vivi. Crocodile and Vivi's stories were very much intertwined pre-time skip, and I believe it will end that way. There's obviously still a big cloud of mystery surrounding what happened at the Reverie, and the scenes that we got suggested that a disastrous incident occurred involving the Kingdom of Alabama thereby potentially affecting Vivi. And Oda has already showed us Crocodile progressing from an antagonist to a somewhat anti-hero. And what better way to complete that character progression than by portraying it nice and clearly that Crocodile has ended up on the other end of the spectrum, or as far as pirates go anyways, and is now a clear ally. And what better way to show this to us than by saving the very same life of his former victim, in turn, saving the very same nation that he once threatened. I am all in for a full-blown Crocodile Redemption arc. Crocodile's ruthless nature makes him so interesting and there are really so many different ways in which Oda can play with his character, precisely because we don't know where exactly he sits on the moral scale. While Oda usually does give his villains more nuance when it comes to their moral standing, this is more of a trend that has really fully developed in the later arcs of One Piece rather than the beginning. Crocodile, especially in his introduction, was one of those characters who were just brutal to their core and only pursuing their own megalomania. Despite this, his role in the Summit War and his becoming allied with Luffy made him somewhat less of a hardcore villain. On one hand, the first thing Crocodile did after escaping Impel Down was to try fight Whitebeard, suggesting his unchanging power-hungry nature. But then on the other hand, he saved Luffy multiple times and also also saved Ace, crossing the encircling wall to save Luffy's brother when his execution time was moved up. Although he claimed it was because he didn't want to give the Marines the satisfaction, it still earned him brownie points in my opinion. The moment after Crocodile saves Luffy from Akainu and delivered this line is probably the most we've seen from his selfless form. Now whether those words came from experience or just his pirate nature in going against authority, that moment suggests a deeper character history that has formed that belief. But still, all of this hasn't necessarily helped in terms of trying to figure out his deep, 
underlying motivations. Unlike some of the more recent villains or antagonists we've encountered in the post time skip, we don't yet know why Crocodile is so power hungry as he is. Which isn't to say we need to or that we will find this information out, but if his re-entry into the story is linked to Vivi and given the current situation where it seems like Vivi may have been in danger, it would be very interesting if Crocodile was somehow involved, maybe even saving the Nefertari princess this time. But the question I'm sure you're all left with is how will Crocodile find his way back into the series? And well... This is where Buggy comes in. If Crocodile does make a reappearance, then I believe it will be connected to Buggy. But to understand why, we need to examine how Buggy himself has remained relevant in the first place. Okay, in my latest video, we discussed how the war between the new four emperors might unfold, and in that video, I mentioned the role Buggy will have in that inevitable epic showdown. And I would have loved to share more of my thoughts on the newly flashy Yonko, but I realized that doing that will require a video of its own, so here we are. Very recently, we got updates on the new Yonko following the downfall of both Kaido and Big Mom. And while Shanks and Blackbeard are familiar faces amongst this rank, and with Luffy only now being officially named an emperor after already being dubbed one post Whole Cake Island, one of these four is not like the other. For years, there have been speculations on who will replace these powerful pirates one day, and the discussion around this topic only got louder and louder as we got closer and closer to witnessing the eventual defeat of two of the most powerful pirates in the One Piece universe. Luffy and Blackbeard being acknowledged as two of the most powerful pirate captains currently in the sea is easily explainable. On top of having seven pirate crews under him with 5,600 members, Luffy just spearheaded the downfall of Kaido and Big Mom by uniting two other supernova crews the Minx, the Samurai of Wano, and this ninja guy Raizo. Pretty impressive if you ask me. Blackbeard on the other hand was the one who took down one of the former emperors of the sea who at the time was considered the strongest man in the world and then acquired his extremely strong devil fruit making Blackbeard the only person with multiple devil fruits. Under his leadership is his 10 titanic captains and since Whitebeard's death, Blackbeard has also won against the remnants of the Whitebeard pirate signifying a victory over impressive combatants and his former fellow brothers like Marco. And it's also been mentioned that Blackbeard has been trying to acquire powerful devil fruits to give to his subordinates. A fearsome crew indeed. And Shanks? Well, he Shanks. It's a name that elicits hype not just to the fanbase, but even to the characters in the series. Yes, yeah, scream time wise, we haven't really seen much, but taking into account how everyone around him will just hears his name react, it gives off the strongest of vibes that this man is not to be messed with despite what level of authority you command. So then, what about Buggy? What exactly has he done that the likes of Luffy's previous and arguably stronger enemies have not been able to achieve? Seriously, even the likes of Crocodile, Doflamingo, and Katakuri now seem somehow inferior to this genius jester. Or at least that would be so in the eyes of those living in the One Piece world. And despite how it may seem in-world in the series, the big question for us still remains. How in the blue hell did Buggy become an emperor? Did he really just buggied himself all the way to the top? Or is there more to this revelation than meets the eye? Perhaps a more flashy reason. It certainly wouldn't be the first time Buggy took all the glory. I mean, Oda wouldn't waste scenes like these. But still, if we go back to considering Luffy's achievement achievement when he was dubbed the fifth emperor by Big News Morgans, he had confronted an emperor of the sea, Big Mom, and had defeated two of her top commanding officers. And not only did he survive to tell the tale, but during the process, he also took command of the Germa, Sun Pirates, and the fire tank pirates. And all of this was soon after gaining allies in the form of seven other powerful pirate crews amassing over 5,000 followers following his victory of yet another one of the Shichibukai. And by that point, Luffy was already well known to be the brother of Ace, the son of the late pirate king, and Sabo, the number two of the revolutionaries. So when you look at all of this, Buggy must have had to have done something to surpass what Luffy 
he did by the end of Whole Cake Island to be considered an official Yonko. And from this list of Luffy's feats, the easiest thing that Buggy could achieve is amassing a huge following. We may not know the exact number, but it was already clear that Buggy was heading in this direction in the post time skip era with the introduction of Buggy's delivery. In fact, we've been witnessing Buggy gain more and more followers over time through the most unlikeliest and simultaneously the most luckiest of situations. The actual quality of these followers may be questionable, but then again, Buggy's been shown to be capable of fooling people into misinterpreting his actions to that of greatness. And irregardless, there's no mistake that Buggy definitely possesses some sort of allure, even if that allure is heavily contaminated with a serious case of misunderstanding. But also, becoming allied with other strong pirate crews is something else on Luffy's list that we can consider. And to be honest, I could really see this happening. No, I don't think Buggy was able to overwhelm notoriously well-known pirates to join his crew purely through strength or even by tricking them into buying whatever he seems to sell to his other unassuming followers. But instead, I can see that powerful pirates would ally with him because it benefits them to do so. Allying with Buggy for their own personal goals and reasons. They don't really have to believe in his greatness like his other followers do, but simply because they still have something to gain through their alliance. Think of Whitebeard at Marineford, for example, who thought Buggy and the new escapees might get in the way of his battle against the Marines, and so decided to form an alliance with Buggy just as a matter of convenience. And this is exactly where I think Crocodile fits in. Crocodile may have partnered up with Buggy in pursuit of his own goals, because despite us being shown little snippets to suggest he is at least still alive, I find it difficult to believe that unless he formed his own crew, just him and Does Bones alone will find it difficult to survive in the new world. Sure, Crocodile was strong enough to be considered one of the Shichibukai in the Grand Line, but this is the new world we're talking about here. The stakes are even higher. And also, Crocodile and Buggy already have a mutual connection in the form of former Baroque Works agent and current member of Buggy's crew, Galdino. The man once known as Mr. Three is one of the very, very few people who are able to see through Buggy's facade, actually aware of his true nature, seeing through the clown's mask. And this could be very important because knowing the hollow substance of Buggy's false bravado, Galdino may have been aware that they need some backing of some actual real strength. And in that case, turning to his former boss Crocodile for help is one of the first things that come to mind. And for Crocodile, he could could very well benefit from having extra men or some greater name recognition for protection. And this is why he would strike some sort of deal with Buggy. Buggy being one of the new warlords and running a successful mercenary business off the back of his infamous name and connection to other legendary figures. Hell, I wouldn't even be surprised if it was actually Crocodile behind Buggy's new emperor status like some master puppeteer. In fact, that panel in chapter 903 actually looks Looks like Crocodile is accompanied by security guards. Perhaps they were mercenaries hired from Buggy's delivery. Actually might be worth making a theory about this. Look at him, he's living large, living comfortably, almost as if he's overtaken another nation and taken control of their castle. Or at least he has some rich and wealthy allies. Crocodile and Buggy furthering their relationship would also make sense because we know that they're already quite well acquainted with each other. Having worked together as part of the crazy alliance that Luffy formed at Impel Down. Granted, their interaction was minimal back then, but that could have been intended for this incoming surprise when they're introduced as the dynamic duo. At the end of the day, the way that Oda writes his story with so many interconnected storylines and character relationships, there really are so many different ways he can take it. But these are just some of my thoughts on how we could see this happen. Let me know of your thoughts by leaving a comment below. Don't forget to like and share this video. Please do subscribe for more One Piece discussions. You can also join our Joy Fleet Discord server or even become a Patreon member. And I do want to thank all our patrons for help supporting the channel. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.